Welcome to Critical Issues, Alternative Views. I'm Lynn Bartley. I'll be your host for today's show. And uh, with me today are two of our regulars and a guest with whom uh, you will be introduced in just a moment. Um, on my right is um, Ron Kramer, Director of the Criminal Justice Program at Western in the Department of Sociology, and uh, Don Cooney, City Commissioner and a member of the um, social work department. Um, our topic today is um, a hot one. We are <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> Quite literally. I thought, just to put it into context, um, because this has become something that people are talking about more often, um, Amy Goodman had a great lead into one of her essays in a recent book starts out, the Pentagon knows it, the world's largest insur uh, insurers know it, now governments may, may be overthrown because of, it, because of it, it is climate change, and it is real. And that's what our guest is going to be talking to about today as soon as you introduce him. Yes, we're very happy to welcome uh, Paul Clements to uh, Critical Issues, back to Critical Issues. He's been on the program before. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Paul is a professor in the Department of Political Science at Western Michigan University and uh, he directs the master's program in international development administration in the political science department. And he's one of the co-chairs of the interdisciplinary humanity study group on climate change at Western, which operates through the Humanity Center. And that uh, interdisciplinary study group has been uh, a meeting now for a, a little bit over a year mm -hmm. and doing some very good things. And so Paul's been helping to get that off the ground. And so, uh, Paul has been focusing a lot of his uh, effort on the issue of climate change in recent years. He has a, a recent book uh, which looks at some broader sets of issues uh, within political science and philosophy, but has a chapter that's devoted to climate change uh, in that book. So Paul, welcome to the program. Thanks, Ron. And maybe the first thing, again, just to start with the most basic thing, the reality of climate change. This is happening, and lots of people know it, but there's still some that deny it. But what's going on with the actual scientific evidence regarding climate change. Sure. Well, the first thing to point out is that, that climate change is definitely happening, and it's definitely caused by, uh, by humans. Um, to, as of today, we're about 0 0.8 degrees Celsius warmer than 100, 150 years ago. And given the momentum, we're pretty much for sure going to get up to 2 degrees warmer within the next uh, 40 or 50 years. Um, in terms of the, the scientific community, every major scientific organization in the United States um, has, a, has, has a public policy saying, yes, climate change is real, and yes, humans are the main cause. So that's the absolute consensus. Even the petroleum engineers, who are the last ones to turn around, uh, have finally supported this view. Uh, and just to, just to look at some of the basic science, if we look at those factors that, that, that could possibly cause climate change um, th besides humans. Uh, one factor is the sun. Another factor is volcanoes. When a volcano erupts, it, it, it puts a lot of dust up into the atmosphere that can change the climate. But both of those factors, if they were oper to, to the extent that they're operating, would be making us cooler right now. Um, whereas if you track the rise in temperature and you track the rise in uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, they track very, very closely. So, uh, so climate change is here. It's going to be. It's going to be. We're going to see more of it in the future, and it's real. Okay. Yeah, the scientific consensus is pretty overwhelming. I saw uh, an article the other day that uh, looked at uh, all the journal articles that dealt with climate change from 1991 to 2012. Right. Uh, almost 14,000 uh, articles published in peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals. Uh, out of that 14,000, there were only 24, such a tiny little sliver that when you make a pie graph, you can't even see it, mm -hmm. uh, that in any way dispute the mm -hmm. scientific evidence. So the consent, I mean, and to get that kind of consensus in any scientific field is pretty rare. Yeah. So the, the scientific evidence is pretty overwhelming mm -hmm. uh, that this is going on. So let's look at some of the other uh, issues related to climate change. Uh, one of them that you focus on in your work is on some of the economic issues, which I think are important because a lot of people oppose doing anything about climate change because they think it's going to wreck the economy, cost jobs, 
It's one of the most frequent arguments that we hear. Our own Congressman Fred Upton likes to use that argument. But let's, what are some of the basic economic factors that we need to really take into consideration when we think about climate change? Well, the economics is a complicated topic, but the first, the first thing to be clear from the economics is that climate change did arise because of the effects of industrialization, which brought us, brought, brought us fossil fuels. Um, and given that the United States is the most uh, wealthy country in the world, also that, that indicates that we've actually contributed the most historically to climate change. Um, and up until a couple years ago, we also had the highest greenhouse gas emissions. Now, ch now, now China's taken over. Mm. So now China has more greenhouse gas emissions than what we have. But no, it's true that our economy historically has been dependent, dependent upon fossil fuels. However, the, the international, the reality is that countries around the world are realizing that they're going to have to be moving towards clean energy. And if that's the direction that we're going, other countries, particularly China, is working very hard to build an, indus an industry that will be generating the equipment and machinery that will be needed for the clean energy economies. Um, and so if we want Michigan to be a strong manufacturing state in the future, we should be getting on that bandwagon. Um, uh, Fred Upton, our congressman, he's been saying that it's going to cost jobs if we address climate change, if, if we, if we have a, something like a carbon tax or something to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we have to acknowledge the reality that in the short term, there are, there are some costs. But the longer you wait, the higher those costs become. And, 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 and then in addition to that, we could be doing things now in terms of building that kind of manufacturing capacity for clean energy technologies that Upton has, has been actively opposing. Um, so uh, the economy of the future is going to be a clean energy economy. And the sooner we start moving there, the stronger we're going to be. So when you, when you talk, uh, Paul, about China, are you talking about solar panels or exactly. anything else? Yeah, or? yeah. China, particularly with solar panels, but, but more generally, I think, I think many people are aware that over the last 30 years, China has had unprecedented economic growth. Yeah. They've had economic growth on the range of, of 8 9% a year over a 30-year period, yes. which has never before been seen in history. And this is with the most populated, uh, populous country in the world. The way they've done that is through the government working synergistically with the private sector, with the government more or less in the lead, to build those, those manufacturing, build, build those industries that they see as are important for their next step. Well, we've had a free market economy, and the free market economy has served us really well, pretty much up until now. But when we see our competitors, China, India, Japan, Taiwan, now India, I mean, um, uh, South Korea, wow. that the governments of our competitors have been working with their industries to, to build their economy and getting faster growth rates the United States has seen, then we, sh we should be looking into that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So apparently there aren't a lot of calls for small government. <laughs> <laughs> Not in China. <laughs> no. No. Not out loud, anyhow, that's for sure. Right. Wow. Uh, there's a concept in the economics field that I think is really important mm -hmm. to, uh, to discuss in relationship to climate change, and that's the <coughs> concept of externality. So I wonder if you would sure. tell us a little bit about what that concept means. This is both in terms of the economics and in terms of how you need to really understand the ethics or the morality of climate change. And that is that the, the basic nature of climate change is it comes from burning greenhouse gases, bur comes from burning fossil fuels, for the most part, that then generate greenhouse gases. And so um, the idea of an externality from economics is a general concept for when you have a producer that produces something and then they sell it for a certain price and the consumer pays that price to get, to get to use what that producer produces. But then there's another effect on other people that aren't captured in the relationship between the producer and the consumer. That's called an externality. Mm -hmm. If it's a negative externality, it's a price somebody else pays. And so the basic I I reality of climate change is producers, maybe they're making cars, maybe they're making electricity, they, they make these things that then generate these greenhouse gases. Somebody buys that, pays the cost of production, but then th the greenhouse gases cause harms, uh, which we, in, in economic terms we talk about as externalities. These are, these are harms, and, but the, the difference between climate change and most other ex externalities is that these 
these, these go all over the world. Mm. And for the most part, they last over 100 years. Um, so so uh, the, the, the costs that aren't captured in that price are paid by, by ourselves, our, grand, our, our children, our grandchildren, and also by people all, all over the world. Wow. One yeah. could say that the fossil fuel industry is dumping their waste into the commons, right? The, exactly, the public exactly. Commons, you got it. Our atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so that's an externality that all of us have to bear, and they escape having to pay the price for that. Correct. So, um, coal, how much of the electricity in the United States comes from uh, being f fueled by coal? Yeah, I don't know the exact figure, but it's in the, in the area of 40, 50 percent, I believe. Okay, 40 to 50 percent. And I, my understanding is that coal is one of the worst producers of these externalities. That's correct. So what would have to happen, we'd, there'd be a major conversion of the way this country produces its electricity. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that is that, that we have the technology today to where we could, we could generate all the electricity we use in the United States, all that we're going to need for this century, um, uh, easily within the United States. To, to, to produce all the electricity the United States needs today, we would just need a 100 square mile grid, let's say somewhere in the desert in Arizona. Oh. Um, cap capturing the sunlight that's coming in. And that would be enough power for all the electricity we need today. And we can transport that. We can... We can and, and, and getting it from, from um, uh, Arizona to Maine would be pretty cheap, pretty easy. Wow. And that would generate huge numbers of jobs. It would generate a lot of jobs, yeah, yeah. But again, the challenge is that you have a whole industry that's, that's built on the current, uh, in, in many cases, coal-based system. Yeah. And, so, and so they're obviously going to oppose making a move to something that's sure. going to undermine their existing investment. Right. And, and then when, when people start talking about alternatives to coal, then they start talking about nuclear. But nuclear has its own problems. It sure does. Um, one thing that we I mean, the basic problem with nuclear is that if you have a big, if you have a, a disaster, it can, it can cause, a, cause a meltdown, like right. a, the, what we almost saw on Three Mile Island. It can yes. cause, cause um, hundreds, hundreds of deaths. And then the waste issue, which then also can cause any number of deaths, it, it goes on for 100,000 years. Right. And we haven't, right. we haven't yet found a good solution yeah. um, for dealing with that waste. And then partly because of that, we've also found that, that even though nuclear produces, quote unquote, relatively clean energy, it's just really expensive. Oh. Um, it's, been, it's been getting, so part of the reason that the nuclear industry hasn't been growing in the United States is that it just, it's just more, more expensive than other, other forms. And solar is, solar, if we move towards greater quantity of solar, that's going to drive the price down. So it will clearly become more efficient than um, nuclear, just on a straight economic cost wow. benefit perspective. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, advertising, you might say, even propaganda related to natural gas. Right that uh, natural gas uh, is the, uh, the clean fossil fuel, so to speak, right? right? Yeah. And that, in fact, there has been uh, quite a bit of a shift toward natural gas use mm -hmm. in the United States, which has reduced fossil fuel emissions to some extent in this country, right? right? Mm -hmm. So how would you respond to this barrage of advertising that we're getting about how yeah. we really need to turn more to natural gas and this will be the solution to our problem? Yeah. Well, it's true that, that per, per unit of energy, nat natural gas doesn't produce as much greenhouse gases as coal or oil. So it's better from that perspective than coal or oil. What, what's not really clearly understood is how far the process of getting that natural gas, how much harm it does to the water resources in particular. Um, uh, that that what, what you're doing with the natural gas is you're digging down deep, deep into the earth and you're injecting these chemicals that then break up the rocks down there, frack it, they call it, under the, un, under the earth. Um, and the problem is you have your water resources there too. And this, these chemicals are very toxic, um, and then you're letting other stuff come up. And so if that stuff gets into the water, that it can, it can disturb the water supply. And the, the problem is that it looks as though there may be good solutions, but the science just isn't definitive on that point yet. And so that's the big question mark with regard to fracking. Um, if it, and we don't know yet. If it turns out that that one can prob be dealt with pretty well, then I think uh, natural gas could be a good transition fuel. I mean, it's, 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 it doesn't give as much greenhouse gases as, as uh, oil and coal. Um, uh, it, still gives, it still gives quite a lot. 
Uh, so, so maybe it might, if the technology works, we have to wait and see, yeah. it could be a transition fuel on the way to really depending upon solar and, and wind. Mm -hmm. But it's still a fossil fuel. It still is going to generate greenhouse gases. It's still a fossil fuel. And we have to drastically reduce those emissions if we're going to uh, stave off uh, more than a two degree Celsius increase in global temperature. Yeah, you brought up the two degree target, which is, I'm, I'm happy you, that you brought that up, because that's the overwhelming consensus um, among the international community, is that we're at 0 0.8 degrees above 100 years ago now. We're going to get to two degrees. If we take strong action, if we take strong ac action just in the next few years, we can probably stop it at two degrees. If we don't take action in the next few years, it's going to keep going, and it could very well reach four degrees in this century, and the consequences of that, we, which we can talk about, would, would, be, would be much, much worse. I mean, I say two degrees is the target. There are many scientists who think even that's too high. Yeah. James, James Hansman says two degrees is a disaster. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, but now our best hope is to limit it to two degrees, it appears, given that we haven't seen any strong action to reduce uh, global emissions. So, uh, you know, two degrees might be our best hope at this point, but even at two degrees, we're going to see some serious consequences. And it's interesting because the U.S. economy and the European economies have pretty much stabilized, and some economies have even gone down a little bit in, a, in the greenhouse gas emissions. But we're already industrialized. It's really yeah. China and India and uh, other, other poorer economies, Indonesia, that are just industrializing now, that have, that have a standard of living far be below ours, and they say, look, you guys caused the problem. We need to have our chance to industrialize. But that's where the real growth is coming from. So the political question is, is going to be, how can we come to some understanding with these other countries in the world that, that, that will get us to this, that will keep us to this two degrees target? Couldn't they industrialize, uh, theoretically, couldn't they industrialize by using alternative sources of energy? It, theoretically, they sure could. But we have to appreciate that they're, they are scientifically far behind the United States. I mean, we have the science where we could move to a clean energy economy. The science is there today. Okay. We, 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 we could do it today. But they've built up, I mean, China's 8%, 9% growth rate is based mainly on coal. Yeah. Um, and so scientifically, Possibly they could, but it would be much, much harder, and they're much less prepared. So, so essentially, um, if we're gonna if we're gonna keep it to this two degrees target, the United States and Europe are gonna have to be supporting countries like China and India um, in moving in, in in improving their technology, so their economies then can develop with the clean energy, not with the dirty energy, which is what they have today. So we haven't shared that te technology with them, is that right? Well, when you talk about technology, it's not, I mean, they can read the books. Okay. Anyone, anyone can read the books. But technology, the technology that's in your economy, that, that, that runs your economy, is built up over, over decades. Okay. The infrastructure, the, the physical infrastructure. infrastructure. Exactly. Yeah. And not just the infrastructure, but the human, the human oh, right. capital, the yeah. people who are, who are doing that. So they have people who are trained in coal. Yeah. They don't have people who are trained in solar. Uh, in terms of in terms of their real their real infrastructure, we don't have that much yet either. We still have to make that transition ourselves. But we need to be we need to be pushing now for the for the scientists and the technicians that can allow not just United States but these other countries also to make that transition. Let me ask you a specific question uh, that that's down from where we've been talking now, and that's about the Keystone Pipeline. Sure. What about the Keystone Pipeline? I mean, um, if the United States says, no, we're not going to let you build that here, right. won't somebody else just do that and the same kind of effects on the climate change occur? You know, I wish I could give a definitive answer to that. And, and, I, and, and the problem is I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Okay. In, in principle, the Canadians could ship that oil to, um, uh, to China. In principle, they could do that. And I don't know what the Canadian government is considering in that respect. Um, so uh, I, I don't know the answer okay. to that. Okay. But we do know that if the U.S. grants approval, that uh, that energy is going to be extracted and mm -hmm. shipped uh, across the United States and then sent to other countries, and that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions will will flow. Huge. And it's a disaster mm -hmm. that if if we in fact go ahead with this, if the Canadian government does develop those tar sands and we do build the pipeline here, then that 
set of events is going to trigger uh, even greater global warming. And uh, people like James Hansen, the, one of the top climate scientists in the world, basically says this is a disaster. It's game over. Yeah. If we allow this to happen, it's game over. Uh, and so this is something that, uh, and this is where the Obama administration can really demonstrate their political commitment. This is where President Obama, who has talked about the issue of climate change uh, in his uh, inaugural address and some other times recently, can really, uh, in a sense, put his money where his mouth is, uh, right, and say, here's a specific action that we're going to take that will start us down this path toward dealing with uh, global warming and climate change. If the Obama administration approves the, this pipeline, then, then all the rhetoric that has been issued about dealing with climate change is revealed as just that, a bunch of hot air that doesn't mean anything. And, and I completely support what Ron is saying, but, but what I would like to emphasize is that the pipeline is one really big piece of the problem, yeah. but that the solution has got to be through the international community, and it's got to be for, where the governments of the world uh, Sign on to something which is going to be which is going to be challenging, which is going to be difficult for for, for, for all for all of them, and and it, that's that's the direction for the solution. The solution is through is through a strong international agreement, where United States and China and India and Brazil and South Africa all agree to 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 where they're heading. That that's the only way, only way that we can get the institutional and economic change that will stop us reaching this two degrees target. Very difficult for them, though, when they have so many poor people there and they see this opportunity and they're to, to say, okay, well, we're going to go into this like that. I mean, it's a long-term solution right. and they got immediate problems. That's, that's exactly right. But, but, but that's all the more reason why the U.S. has to take the lead, right? Uh, and we're not going to get that international agreement unless the United States takes the mm -hmm. lead, exercises some leadership. Right? And every time we have these international uh, conferences right. on climate change, you get all this discussion of this and discussion of that. But the reality is simple as what you've said, that without U.S., without American leadership, it's not going to happen. So, so we need American leadership to get that international agreement. No, and, and Paul, you could talk a little bit maybe about the, uh, the international movement here. We mm -hmm. had the... UN Framework Convention sure. uh, back in 92 already, mm -hmm. and that led to Kyoto, and, and we do have regular a conference of parties uh, to sure. that agreement that are, are meeting and trying to come up with an agreement, but right. so far nothing's been happening. But there is sort of a framework there in place, isn't there? There's been a framework, and there's been these discussions. Um, it's interesting that it was back in 1988, I'm sorry, yeah, 1988, when the U.S. Congress directed the Secretary of State to uh, pursue some kind of international discussions on this. And it was just a year after that that the first uh, UN organizations got started working on it. So again, that's an, an indication of, of, of the US leadership. Mm -hmm. Then it took just a couple of years until 1992 for the first inter international meeting which uh, produced the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, mm -hmm. which has been the major in international institution working on this. Um, and by, by 92, when they had their first meeting, the, the first question was, you know, is it real and is it caused by people? Mm -hmm. And the answer was yes and yes. This is something we need to work on. This is back in 1992. Wow. And, and there was an agreement that United States signed on to, President um, Bush at that time signed on to, saying, yeah, we'll do something about this. The first Bush. The first Bush. But it was voluntary. You know, and, and, and our full right. Senate ratified it, but it was voluntary and, and it didn't put any numbers on it. So it was an easy, th an easy thing to sign. Then it was in 1997, five years later, that the IPCC, this inter intergovernmental panel, met in Kyoto in Japan. And, and at that time, they, 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 they said, okay, we need to take this seriously. We need to have some, 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 some specific targets for each country of how far they're gonna redu reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Bill Clinton signed it. But then the Senate said, if this is not, if this is going, it, unless we can get China and India on board, and unless, and if it's going to do any harm to our economy, we're not going to support it. So without ratification from the Senate, it, it couldn't go forward. Um, several of the European countries did sign on, Canada and Australia did sign on. And so they've had some, they've had some moderate movement in the last decade and a half under the, what they call the Kyoto Accords. But even what they've been doing under Kyoto hasn't, hasn't made that much difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have this, this inter, intergovernmental framework, 
we have all these conferences that have come on every two or three years. It, it, it's, the, it's a conference in Copenhagen a few years ago mm -hmm. that came up with a two degrees target. Um, but uh, without, without getting most of the governments of most of the countries in the world on board, um, again, without, without US leadership to do that, to take specific steps with, with, with explicit targets of how far you're gonna reduce your emissions. Um, well, it hasn't, had, it hasn't had significant effect yet, and it will not have sig significant effect until we get that. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to point out that the uh, head of uh, Greenpeace in the United Kingdom, after the failure of uh, the Copenhagen meetings, was uh, quoted as saying, Copenhagen is a crime scene tonight. <laughs> a crime scene. This is a crime that these right. countries came together and in the end, even though they agreed to the two degree target, they did nothing substantive that would move us in that direction. Therefore, they s he saw this as a criminal act on the part of these governments. And, and if you want to ask why it's a criminal act, it comes right back to that concept of externality. Because you have these, 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 these companies and these societies producing these greenhouse gases that even today are already causing probably 400,000 deaths a year due to hunger and malnutrition mm. and, and disease. And in the future are going to be causing many, many more deaths than that um, that are imposing costs on our grandchildren. So um, here in Michigan, many of the tree species and animal species we have today are not going to be able to survive in a world that's four degrees warmer. Um, so Fred Upton is putting our water and our, and our forests and our uh, animals, our, our, our natural world at risk. To say nothing of our grandchildren. <laughs> Not to say nothing of our grandchildren, exactly. But the problem with Fred Upton is that um, when he speaks publicly of this, he just dismisses all this. And, he's, and it's very difficult to challenge him with facts. You know, I mean, he just said, well, that's not true. And, and, you know, and then he just goes on. Well, what's interesting is he's had a turnaround, and that is if you looked at his website uh, three or four years ago, at that time he said, yeah, we really need to do something about these greenhouse gases. We need to take it seriously. But then once he, was, once he got the position of chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, then since then he's taken another line. And this is actually pretty important because the House Energy and Commerce Committee is the most powerful committee in the House of Representatives with respect to policy for climate change. So he's one of the most powerful people in our government who has responsibility for our government's policy on this. And in that position of power, his, his position has essentially been uh, a, a denialist one, a de denialist in terms of action. Mm -hmm. Ed Sackley, his representative here in Kalamazoo, he said this Monday that Fred Upton supports a free market approach. Well, I mean, a free market approach can't deal with those externalities. A free market approach can't get us to that international agreement. So a free market approach means runaway climate change. Now you've met with him, haven't you? Haven't, hasn't there been a delegation of people who, we, to meet with him? We invited him to oh, come to meet him. with our faculty group, and he never replied. He never, he never uh, answered answer our, our letter. So Paul, um, because this issue is so important and your concern is so great on this issue, this has led you to make a decision uh, about jumping into the congressional race uh, against Fred Upton yeah. uh, next, the next round, right? That's, that's, that's right, yeah. Um, and I want to be clear here, and that is that it has been the climate change issue that, that pushed me into this race. That I think that Fred Upton's um, ac actions uh, and inaction here in actually pushing, pushing the Congress in the wrong direction and the harm that's going to cause to Michigan, the harm that's going to cause to the United States, and the harm it's going to cause to the world is, so, is, is really serious. And that's what got me into this race. Um, but, but having said that, I also need to, need to say that, that I'm not a single issue. Well, I'm running for Congress, but I'm not a single issue candidate. That um, if we look at our national policies in terms of education, in terms of our national debt, in terms of criminal justice, in terms of our foreign policy with military spending. There are a lot of issues that I want to be, that I want to be working on and where I think Fred Upton's, Upton's policies are taking us in the wrong direction. And you have a track record on all, each of those issues uh, that I think is very admirable. So I think it's great that you're doing that. Well, thanks, Don. You know, and I, sitting next to Don here, <laughs> you know, he's, he's run this race before. Um, uh, I really admire the, the work that Don's done on this. Well, I'm glad you're doing this. I think it's, it's important to raise those issues, and it's terrific. Great. I'm glad you're doing it. Keep raising them. Keep raising them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, 
there's, there's another issue that I want to kind of have you talk about here, Paul, and that is having to do with sort of the ethics of all of this, because right. I think this is really important to sure. put it in an ethical framework. <coughs> and uh, you approach this from a very specific ethical tradition, so why don't you talk a little bit about the broader ethical issues in your own uh, ethical uh, position here. Sure. Well, when we talk about the ethics of, of, of social issues, it's a question of the distribution of costs and benefits. And we have, with any, with any, with any society, with any set of institutions, the, the way we live together is if we, we cooperate, and our cooperation yields certain benefits, and then those benefits get, get distributed somehow. And those are the, that, that's the question of social ethics. Um, so when we think about climate change, climate change uh, gets caused by certain activities, for the most part, that generate greenhouse gases, and then those activities have certain costs. And so the question then is how do we organize the, the, the costs and benefits of, 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 the, of this set of activities? Um, you mentioned my book, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and say a few words about that. Sure. Great. Um, uh, uh, I had the good fortune as an undergraduate to take a class with the leading political philosopher of the last century, a guy by the name of John Rawls. Um, he wrote A Theory of Justice. Mm -hmm. And one of his key contributions to political philosophy was a way of looking at how we should approach fundamental questions of social justice. And he calls it the original position. He says that if we want to ask how should a society be organized, we should imagine that we don't know what our position is in that society. We don't know if we're rich or poor, we don't know if we're black or white, if we're, if we're male or female, um, if we're healthy or maybe if we're, if we're unhealthy. And, and from a position of not having that information from there, that's the right place to choose principles for organizing society that'll be fair. And so he calls it justice as fairness. Mm -hmm. Well, if we look at, at the, the climate change system, the climate change issue, then, and, and Rawls is what he calls his, his, his original position, if we want a fair approach to climate change, we should imagine that we, as if we didn't know if we live in the United States or in India or in the Maldives, you know, which, which might uh, disappear, be, disappear yeah. from the rising <laughs> ocean level. Yeah. Imagine we don't know where we live. Imagine we don't know when we live, if we live today right. or in 50 years or in 150 years. And then from taking it from that perspective, from there, then what approach would we want to have for climate change? If we're going to be 150 years from now, we still want economic growth. We still want a society that has, that, that has industry, but we also want a world that we can live in, yeah, <laughs> not, not a world four or five or six or seven degrees hotter than what we have today. And, and so as I think the time element is very important too, because it's the children and the grandchildren that are going to be feeling the real effects of this if something is not done. Well, we're already feeling the effects. I mean, you probably noticed that last year was the hottest year on record in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. Um, right now, New Zealand is, is having their worst drought, I think, in 50 or 60 years. Um, March, uh, this last March that, 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 that we're just we're in, is over right now, or we're in right now, or, uh, or the last March was the hottest March e ever, ever on record worldwide. Um, so, so we're already having these effects. Um, I teach about international development, and there are many countries in Africa that depend on regular rainfall, and both in terms of drought, but also in terms of just irregularity in the weather, that's why we have 400,000 people dying a year, because we're already having the, these effects. But the point is that the effects you see at 0 0.8 degrees are far, far lower than the effects we're going to see yeah. at 2 degrees. Yeah. You know, we're heading to 2 degrees. It's going to get worse. The issue is that we need to take the, take the steps now, to, so, so, so after 2 degrees it stops, so we don't keep going to 3 or 4 or 5 degrees when it would be far, far more tragic. And I was just looking here, the, the average temperature, uh, 8.6 degrees, um, and uh, more than uh, 15,000 temperatures uh, um, were broken nationally. Yeah. So that uh, it's, it's a tremendous impact, yeah. and I'm wondering, you know, why, why we don't feel it more strongly. Is it the propaganda that goes on, or... Is it the idea, you know, I can remember my grandparents saying, 
this is before air conditioning, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, this has been the hottest summer we've had in a long time. There's, I think there's that uh, edging yeah. away from looking at it realistically. It's this way now, but it will return to a state that we're more mm -hmm. familiar with. Well, I think one thing we need to recognize in that context is that there have, has been a systematic effort at disinformation mm -hmm. by the, 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 the oil industries um, and, and with a few conservative foundations. So it's the oil industry and some conservative foundations. Yeah, and they've, they've paid, paid scientists not to, not to lie, but to say, well, we're not so sure, right. to raise questions, to introduce, introduce doubt. So, so many Americans have believed that the science is, is unsure, yeah. when for, for, for many years, the sci scientific community, the, the consensus has been complete. Um, so so there, there's been a bit of disinformation. And then also part of it is, you know, this, these are very complicated issues. The, mm -hmm. the, the possibilities are a long, the worst possibilities are a long time away, and they're pretty frightening. So I can understand that, that it's hard for people to get their minds around it, but it's important for them to do that. Yeah. But we haven't learned from the cigarette company's propaganda ah, in trying to get us go. to believe what you've just described. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's, there's the power of the same uh, people who were involved in that particular campaign also work in this campaign mm -hmm. on climate science denial. Right. Uh, same exact people. They have some scientific credentials, but they uh, use them in a way to uh, uh, enhance the interest of particular industries, the tobacco industry, or now in this case, the fossil fuel industry. But so, th so there's that level. I mean, there's this sort of cynical um, self-interest, uh, economic interest, uh, you know, that leads to opposition to doing anything about climate change. But there's also, it's a deeper problem uh, that we're finding is that often uh, people, because they have developed a particular cultural or ideological worldview, they have a commitment to certain kinds of core values. Uh, they have a commitment to free markets, and they have a commitment to uh, individualism as opposed to collectivism. And so what we find is that because of those cultural commitments, uh, even if people are well-educated and have some background in science, they, the, the, those, those interests and their involvement with other people who share those cultural and ideological commitments causes them to uh, dismiss the evidence and, and to not take any action about climate change. Mm -hmm. Makes it a much more attractable uh, problem uh, in that regard. If, if your commitment is to individual responsibility and small government, then climate change um, is a very, is a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to come to grips with because what climate change is going to require is, is, is a, a stronger role for government mm, than, right. than we've typically seen and it's going to require stronger international agreements than what we've seen, seen in the past. So, um, it, I mean, again, if your commitment is to small government and individual responsibility, if you want to see individual responsibility as just being responsible for yourself and your family and your immediate circle, that's one thing. But if you think of individual responsibility as being responsible for the effects of your action on other people, however far away in time or space those might be, then that, that ought to be pushing you in, pushing you in another direction. Um, but it's, it's, a big, it's a big shift to make intellectually. Right. And again, I think when you talk to Sackley and he said that Upton's position was the free market is the way to approach us. Well, right. there's this tremendous commitment to some mythical thing called the free market yeah. uh, yep. that's going to solve all the problems, right? And <coughs> you talk about believing in fairy tales. Uh, but, but that's a very strong ideological and cultural commitment that's shared very widely within the Republican Party and in certain other kinds of circles. And so even well-educated, smart people uh, can be uh, taken in by that, that those those kinds of uh, cultural commitments and right. led to dismiss the overwhelming evidence uh, about climate change. Isn't right. It? And, and and again, that's the point where let's be clear about the economics of this, and that is economic science has understood externalities for 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 decades. And, and when there's an externality, the right thing to do in terms of economics is to have a tax that, impo that so, so the people who generate this problem pay the price of it. Um, and that would be a, that would be a carbon tax. Right. So economists, they've, they have the infrastructure to say, to say how a free market needs to, needs to take account of something like climate change. But, but that's, um, uh, Fred Upton has been diametrically opposed to that.
he would say, then that takes money away from the companies and then they're going to lay people off and we're going to cause mass unemployment. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it's also sort of a myth of the self-rating mechanism. Yeah. That no matter what problem right. we're facing and no matter how long we deal with it, something will come along and often it's technology. Mm. Something mm -hmm. will come along that will bring us back to the state that we were in, which we, in which we saw it as being the ideal state. And uh, that's um, dreamland yeah. in our highly technological world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We can believe that uh, all the children are above average, but uh, <laughs> it isn't, uh, it isn't um, real. That's right, that's right. Huh, yeah, wow. So, um, how do we move forward? Well, <laughs> that's, that's the challenge. Yeah, you know, again, that's partly why I'm running for Congress, is because, yeah. it's because the only yeah. way to get the effective action is through the, through the political arena. Yes. Um, and I think the politics, the national politics on this are very, very clear. And that is to say that there was one instance when um, the Governor Schwarzenegger in California, yep. he, 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 he moved forward some of the strongest greenhouse gas control legislation we've seen in the United States. Yeah. So it's not, so the Republicans have done the right thing some of the time. But if you look at national policy, it's been consistently the Democrats who've been pushing positive movement on this, and it's been consistently the Republicans who have been opposing it. So from the perspective of, of greenhouse gases and climate change, the, the political direction is very, very clear. Unless the Republicans change their tune, then, then we've got to get a Democratic majority in both the House and the Senate uh, in order to get the possibility of the president doing the things in the, in, in the international community that would allow an effective response to this. That's very good. Good, I like that. So, but they, their rhetoric is, is compelling. Um, look, we're interested in all of the above mm -hmm. philosophy. We're interested in... Um, keeping our economy going and generating jobs. Right. And, and that appeals to people. Both those things appeal to people, I think. And it takes a lot of work to get people to see that th there's a much different side to that. And um, the all of the above thing doesn't work. And uh, the economy um, is, is going to be harmed much more in the long run if we don't do something about it. And actually, we could, through... Um, a different kind of a, a, an energy approach, we could actually generate jobs. I mean, that, they're, they're tough sells. They are tough sells, and, and the short-term movement is, is, is disruptive. It can be painful, it would be painful right. for some people, but, but the reality is that the, that the long-term is so much worse if we don't do it, yes. and so much better if we do it, that if, if we want to see you know, famine around the world, if we want to see economies collapsing in many parts of the world, um, if we want to see f you know, serious f foods, f food shortages, right. then um, uh, all, the, all the above for energy, keeping going with fossil fuels and keeping going with, with coal nuclear. and nuclear is, is, is the way to go. Yeah. But if we want uh, a, 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 both a, a national society where our children can enjoy many of the of the, um, the, the national parks and, and, the, and uh, the, you know, Boy Scout in the, in the forests and, mm -hmm. and, and canoeing in the rivers and, and, and having the wildlife that, that we grew up with. If, if we want that, then we need to start taking action now. And in terms of the economy, you know, if we want to have those jobs in the future, we need to be working our economy into, into a manu for, particularly for Michigan, into manufacturing that builds those manufacturing industries that supply that clean energy economy. And we can do it if we start, but if we don't do it, then the Chinese and the Taiwanese and the South Koreans are gonna be so far ahead, it'll be very hard for us to catch up. Wow, that's, that's very powerful, what you're saying. That's good, I like it a lot. But, okay, didn't the State Department just come out with a uh, study that showed that there would be minimal um, environmental effects from the Keystone Pipeline? Didn't they just come out with that? No. Um, no? That's my understanding is that their study said that if we don't do it, someone else will. Oh, okay. Um, I see. So what they're saying is that uh, the effects, will, whatever the effects are, that they're, they're already They're going to be in, there in, in, anyhow, right. and so it doesn't matter what we do, so we might as well take advantage of it. I mean, exactly. Right. Yeah, it's the same argument about if I buy a car that doesn't use a lot of gas but uses electricity. 
I'm still uh, seeking the source that's creating the power. Yeah. To, so it evens out, which of course is not. not and that was not the accurate. same thing that people said in, when companies we try to get companies out of South Africa. Well, if we get out of there, uh, somebody else will come in, and uh, right. the cheap labor they'll get the cheap labor. We won't get it, so it doesn't make any difference. Right. All the other lemmings are jumping off the cliff, so why don't we just do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that has been a curiosity to me, and I know we've talked about this on the program before, and that is the role of the military. Ah. And one of the four um, crises we've been looking at on the program uh, since we began the second round are the, of course, the ecological crisis and economic crisis, the militarism is a crisis, and democracy. Mm -hmm. And if we... And I've, I've heard Ron talk a little bit about it, and uh, I'd be interested if we could spend some time. Apparently, the military may be one of the best informed and best prepared to deal with the consequences of um, the disasters that right. may occur. Right. What, uh, yeah. what is going to be the continuing role of the military, and can it be used on the peace side of the equation? Yeah, I think there's three three pieces of that, that equation that I would like to address. Um, one is, and I think we, need to, we should thank Carl Levin for this as chair of, uh, chair of the Armed Services Commission. And he's actually been pushing the military to be building cleaner energy technologies mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the military infrastructure. So the military is actually one of our leaders in implementing so clean, clean energy technology, which is a positive thing. We should point out that they're one of the greatest contributors of greenhouse oh, gases. So right. yes. at this point, <laughs> this is yeah. certainly necessary. This is for reducing them to do this, the, the right. harm, but it nevertheless is taking a step yes. in the right direction. Um, number two, the military, according to their mission, is they have to look at the threats facing the United mm. States in the future, and. This is why, you, from, the, from, the, from the quote from Amy Goodman, of what, I'm what I imagine she was referring to, they see clearly enough that if you have societies collapsing mm -hmm. because of drought and because of lack of water and because of other effects of climate change, that that's going to create a much more dangerous world right. for the United right. States. Exactly. So the military, is, from a strategic perspective, is already taking those steps, be beginning to take the steps. And the thing is that, that you can't really prepare very well for a world where societies are collapsing all around you. Mm. Yeah. you know, there's no simple preparation for that. <laughs> mm. yeah. But they're, taking, they're, they're working, they're moving in that direction. But the third thing I think we need to look, emphasize here is, is the question for the United States of where does our long-term security lie? And there, where we've been spending um, $800, million, $800 billion a year on our military in recent years, almost half of world military spending. And, you know, the Chinese like to say that where there's a crisis, there's an opportunity. And so if climate, climate, climate change is a crisis, so the question is, well, what's the opportunity there? Um, and I think the opportunity is if we can be organizing our relationship with a country like China in terms of working together to address the threat of climate change, then, then neither China nor the United States needs the military buildup that both countries have seen mm -hmm. in, the last, in the last decade. Um, so far, uh, in recent years, total international foreign assistance development aid has been about $100 billion, billion a year. U.S. military spending has been about $800 billion wow. a year. To address, to address the damage and harms caused by climate change today, we needed about another $100 billion. We need to about to, to double um, the, the, the international development expenditure from, from where it is today. Um, we also need to be getting those, the, the technologies out there, bu building the technologies and sharing them with countries mm -hmm. like China and India. Um, uh, we also need to be able to monitor one another's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, these are going to be institutionally really challenging things, but if we can get, if we can get our relations with, with our potential adversaries Worked, worked out in, in terms of addressing these issues, then we can shift money from, mm. from the military to cooperation mm. that will still make us stronger and safer in the future. Excellent, excellent, I like that. I, I think the discussion about the, the military and climate change uh, can help maybe people understand the concepts of mitigation and adaptation. Oh, right? good, I'm glad those, you... You see those a lot with regard to the climate change literature, and of course mitigation means 
reducing the emissions, right? right? And we have to have drastic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions if we're going to keep to that two degree Celsius increase. But we know that even at two degrees, there are going to be many serious consequences. We've already begun to experience some of the consequences, and so we also have to have some kind of uh, planning for how we're going to adapt. And so with the military, as you just pointed out, uh, they are one of the greatest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions, but they are taking steps to mitigate there. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only do we need to do that with the military, we need to do that more generally across society. And then in terms of adaptation, uh, the military is looking ahead and how are they going to adapt to a world in which uh, right. global warming occurs and right. various, but, you know, but the, but the fundamental question there is how we use our resources. You know, if we want to have um, essentially 60% of our discretionary budget going to the military, is that the best way to secure the long-term security of our country? Right. Um, and, and alternatively, if we're going to need resources to, 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 to change our energy structure to, for, for the mitigation and for the adaptation, then basically some of those resources need to come from resources both in the United States and in China and in other countries that are presently going in to the military. So the point is that we're going to be safer and more secure if we, if we halt that warming at two degrees than if we let it, if we let it go on indefinitely. We're going to be safer and more secure if we use this as an opportunity to work with the other governments on the, in, in the world on this very challenging issue um, and through cooperation uh, reduce the expectation of military conflict. So, so, so both China and United States, which China is going to be the superpower, the, the other superpower with us in the coming, in the coming century, century. So both China and the United States can reduce both countries' military spending and freeing up those resources to address the fundamental security threat of climate change. Mm -hmm. So adaptation can be progressive, fair, and just, ethical, exactly. or adaptation can be the armed lifeboat, right? And I, mm. my fear is that our tendency for our military is going to be to take the armed lifeboat approach, you know, to right. uh, use the military to put down the conflicts that are going to arise from right. climate change without thinking about how can we also right be working cooperatively to head off. And let's be clear, it's the military's job to take the lifeboat approach if the politicians don't solve the problem. I mean, it's the military's job to, right. to, to, to defend, defend the country. Yeah. If the politicians don't deal with it, if there's going to be all these conflict, that's what they ought to do. Yeah. But it's, it's our, our job as citizens, it's the government's job to, 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 to head us in, in, in a better direction. Yeah. And Andrew Pasevich would, would, would point out that, that economically that will be impossible to do that, to really defend ourselves when there's so much crisis all sure. over the world. And sure. we're, we're so, so it's a losing strategy. Sure. Yeah. I mean, n not to mention the fact that, you know, if we have a chance to, to, to stop the conditions right. that would be causing societies to collapse, yeah. and that's, that's something we ought to consider. Certainly, certainly, that makes sense. Yeah. What is China spending on its military now? Yeah, I don't have that figure. Um, I know they've been they've been increasing they've it. They've been increasing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure. But nowhere near. Nowhere, nowhere near, near where ours. we are. <laughs> nowhere near. I ours. mean, it was way lower than us. Yes. but It's right. about a hundred billion, I think. But that. Uh, yeah. I know In terms of total spending, it. I believe they're, I believe they're below twenty percent of U.S. total spending. Okay. Okay. Paul, any final uh, thoughts? We're at just probably a minute or so to go here. Uh, final comments you'd like to leave us, our audience, with today? Well, I mean, one thing is that, that whatever in, any individual can do, whatever any business or government entity can do to be reducing our, our, our carbon footprints, to be, to be reducing greenhouse gas emissions, is going to be a step in the right direction. And we can't solve the problem without a strong international agreement, but every individual step still helps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Oh, are we going to sit and we still have five minutes left? Okay, we still have five minutes left. Oh, okay. great, okay. great. Okay. So we one of the things that, I, that from my s superficial reading of this whole thing is it's, individuals can do some things and they should, mm -hmm. but it's really public policy right. that has to do it. And that's, that's why you're running for Congress, and, right. and that's why there has to be this change on the national level to change our whole policy. That's right. Yeah, so it's just striking that, that that's there. But... Um, you know, Gore's film really did get people thinking. And I think we need some more of that kind of a thing to, 
that's going to get into the popular culture that's going to help people see this more clearly. I mean, the scientific culture is right. there, yeah. but the popular culture is yeah. still, it's not there. I mean, Bill McKibben has been doing some good work to yes. organize, organize people on this issue. We expect him to, him to be, be visiting and speaking here in Kalamazoo oh, in October. Great. That's going to be great. Um, looking forward to fixing up that date. Yeah. Um, but no, certainly, if we don't see uh, uh, the, the, the people, if we don't see a popular movement pushing this, it, it, it looks as though the, the, the politicians are not going to do it on their own. Right. Never. Right. I, I want to come back to the jobs issue. Okay. Because I think that's a really important one. Um, and uh, here, I, don't, I, I want to th say that, that, that the climate change and the technology issues, these are long-term things. You know, if we want to look at, at, at Michigan jobs 10, 20, 30 years from now, then getting into the clean energy technologies is exactly the right question. But if we want to look at the overall jobs situation in the United States and the fact that we still have very, very high unemployment, even as the stock market has climbed back up into oh, the yeah. territory of where it was before, before the crisis, then I think we need to look at some other failures of, failures of government policy. Mm -hmm. And I know in our last few minutes, this is a, this is a big topic to bring up. <laughs> um, but one thing, because we're talking about the military, mm -hmm. and that is that, that for every dollar you spend on education, a, a dollar spent on the military and a dollar spent on education, in education is going to get you three times more jobs than a dollar spent on the military. A dollar spent in health care is going to get you, depending on how you spend it, two, three, four times more jobs than a, than a dollar spent on the, on the military. Um, so just in terms of, of the structure of our society, the, 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 uh, our, our extraordinarily high military budget is not helping us in terms of, in terms of employment issues. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, I just was reading in, in the New York Times this morning. There's a headline about what's happening with young people today and how their expectations are right. to live less than where their parents were for the first time, I guess, in in American history. Right. And 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 it's it's just so hard for a lot of these young people. I mean. Like, we're celebrating that we've been able to get a number of people from here jobs at American Axel for $10 an hour. I mean, when I first started on the city commission, I would be screaming if we were getting people jobs for $10 an hour. Right. But now we're so desperate, we're taking them. Right. So. And so there, the, a lot of the answer really is education. Yeah. And um, if we want to be building, if we want to be building a, a society that can su support good paying jobs in the future, We've, we've still got to be increasing our, our investments in, in pre, preschool, primary, secondary, and higher education. Yeah. That's got to be a fundamental, I mean, that's a deep shift that our society needs, needs, to, needs to be working on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a, a, a certainly a circumstance with four educators sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. I mean, the, the way in which these issues are interwoven and the yeah. kind of reciprocal effect they have absolutely. on each other, mm -hmm. we have got to look at it in terms of, of the uh, multiplicity of, uh, of, of dynamics involved in it. Yeah. And, um, well, we're just about yeah, out of we're time. Just about so, uh, time. Paul, Paul I want to thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, Paul. That was uh, great. That was great. Yes. For, for being here today. And we wish you luck in your campaign. And uh, I think we might be able to bring you back on uh, in, the, in the coming months to talk about some other issues as well. So uh, thank yeah. you for being here today. Yeah. Absolutely. And Don, Thanks, Paul. Ron, great. Thanks, thank Don. you all for uh, Good show today. I'm very pleased to be part of this and good luck with your campaign. And we will be back um, in a couple of weeks with a new program. We look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now. <laughs>